I've titled this talk, Something Dies Inside Me, every time I hear the word intersectionality. And if you're hoping for a lively debate with a female Jordan Peterson, I'll be delighted to disappoint you. Um, I'm here for exactly the same reasons as you, um, because I wanted to live in a world where lives are worth living with dignity and in harmony with nature. And specifically, I'm here because about three to four years ago, I had this fundamental, profound loss of faith crisis. You know, I just stopped believing in the possibility of change. Um, I was completely burnt out. Uh, I lived in London at the time, which was a city that I tried so hard to love and failed for eight years. And um, I, I spent most of my income on childcare fees and the rent for this tiny little house we lived in. And every day I would wake up at five in the morning and by 7.30 I would be on a commuter train going into central London, you know, having dropped off my daughter at nursery. And I would do a full day's work and then run back, pick her up, go home, cook dinner, do bedtime and then do some more work um, before collapsing in a heap for the whole cycle to start again the following day. And I was just so anxious, you know, all of the time, but I didn't even realise it. You know, my stomach was constantly in knots, so much so that at one point I had to have investigations and treatment. And now I look at pictures of myself from that time and wonder who that faded creature was. Um, back then I was, I was almost 20 years into my career um, as an advocate for social change, and I had just stopped believing that I was making the tiniest shred of difference. You know, around me, mature democracies were unravelling and conspiracy was rife and refugees were dying in the sea on Europe's shores. And as far as I could tell, the planet was still going to hell in a handcart. So, you know, what good was my lovely, well-meaning advocacy? I felt like I was heading headfirst into a wall. And I'll tell you how that story unfolds later. I came back. <laughs> the main thing about it is that I had these unutterable truths that just needed to come out, you know. I didn't even dare admit to myself that I was deeply miserable. Um, I was in a loving marriage and had a beautiful child and um, I got to do exciting work that took me from, you know, subsistence farmers in Africa to movers and shakers at the top of governments. I mean, what was there to complain about? And yet I yearned for something that was radically and truly better to be possible. But I didn't dare say it, you know. And I'm here to tell you that those unutterable truths that we harbour need to come out because the world that we yearn for is actually possible. It's within our reach. And that me and you and everybody around us we're getting in our own way, in the same way that I got in my own way back in those London days. People like me, and probably you, and all people really, you know, we think of our circumstances as barriers to change, okay? Um, if only things were less complicated, um, if only I didn't have to earn a living, I would be pursuing my dreams right this very moment, you know? or if vested interests weren't so vested, would be changing society in an instant. I had to hit that brick wall back in my London life to know that I couldn't continue in the same vein, that it wasn't an option and that I had um, to jump and live by my truths and be true to my beliefs. So what I did in 2019 with Brexit as a <laughs> backdrop um, I moved my family to Brussels to start anew and to follow my gut feeling that a new way of doing social change was needed. And, you know, normal people, reasonable people who move country, <laughs> have jobs lined up and security and all the right things in place. I didn't have that. I just knew I had to go. Um, I left with this unmet yearning and a vague idea of how I was going to pursue it. And I'm still alive to tell the tale. <laughs> and liberated and transformed by it. So I'll be telling you a bit more as we go. The other thing that us well-meaning folk tell ourselves 
or think is that the others are the barriers to change, you know, with their prejudice and their lack of understanding or their greed or their bad will. You know, if only they could stop being so backward. They are ruining everything, we tell ourselves. So we sort of, we try to judge them into submission. You're a polluter, you're a nature destroyer, racist, transphobe, you know. We try to defeat them with our intellectual superiority and with our unimpeachable ethics. And we insist that they must change for big change to be possible, okay? And increasingly, nobody comes to our tent. Nobody comes to this church of ours of angry and sanctimonious judgment. And this is no exaggeration, okay? You only have to look at the state of progressive politics in the global north as it withers in the face of other forms of expression, like right-wing populism. Nobody is coming to our tent. You know, our politics feels like it's dying. Even we have stopped believing in it. I mean, all around me, I see wonderful, well-meaning people who despair at the state of the world, who genuinely wonder if better and kinder and fairer is still possible, you know, who despair at the fact that we're losing a culture war that we never even wanted to enter, um, that we can't really save our planet and, you know, that maybe we'll have even worse injustice after COVID. You know, we look at the rules-based international order and it seems to be dying a horrible death you know with states that were once pillars of the international community now gone rogue it looks bad and of course all of it is true or well it could be true um it doesn't have to be true it's not compulsory there are things that we can do about it i'm going to put this very simplistically okay when my beautiful seven-year-old daughter of London nursery fame tells me about the intense ups and downs and injustices that she suffers on a daily basis in the school playground, I add to her disappointment by telling her that the only person she truly has control over is herself. That her own reactions and behaviour are the only space that is hers to negotiate and that if she models the love and affection and kindness that she wishes to receive she has a better chance of persuading and god it must seem so disappointing you know it must be crushing to hear that because i actually remember from my own childhood um my mother telling me those very things and how i hated it then you know how i wanted her to intervene and demand justice for me and of course, I also worry that I'm raising my kid to roll over, to, to turn a blind eye, you know. Um, and you must be wondering if that's what I'm about to ask of you, uh, to stop penalising bad behaviour, to just be nice, to rise above. <laughs> and I don't think that's true. I don't think that's what we need to do. I don't think we need to roll over. But I do think that we need to do the work close to home first before others can follow. By that, I mean we need to create a space for others to make the right decisions for themselves and to do that as their champions, okay? Not as the security staff at the gates of heaven. We need to be unimpeachable and to be the image of those visions that we love and to be congruent with our values and our worldview because I think our despair stems from that incongruence, from that absence of congruence, from the fact that we sense that our values and our dreams are not fully aligned with what we do and with what we say and how we say it. So, we only have our agency over ourselves and we can't make other people swallow our value set. I want us to spend some time thinking about how we make them feel, the, these people out there who are not like us and why they hate it so much, you know, why they don't visit our tent. And the first thing that I need you to remember is that our words shape our imaginations, what we think is possible. They even shape what we think is real, okay? They help us conceptualize the present, reality, and imagine what the future could bring. So they can excite, but they can also limit us, they can imprison us. So I'd like us to spend some time together going through some of our vocabulary, 
for change, if that's okay with you. I dropped intersectionality into the title of this uh, talk to provoke you a little bit. But it's an important word and it's actually one of my particular pet hates because of the way in which we misuse it. It's one of those words that we wear as a badge of honour, you know, of our intellectual refinement, our sophistication. I mean, what the hell even is it? Don't answer that. I know what it is. You know, I'm a woman, a migrant, a, mi a mother. I know that it's there to encompass my story and the stories of others that are much richer and more painful than mine, okay? But let me tell you, that word does not tell my story. It doesn't tell any stories. It was never designed to. It's merely a ticket to a very small club of us correct thinking folk, folk who co-opted an analytical, technical term coined by Crenshaw to explain injustice. It was never meant to replace the story it dissected. And ask yourself, honestly, if the people whose lives it describes for whom we are champions and defenders, see themselves and their lived experience in it, because our language needs to tell those stories, okay? Take LGBTQ+, reducing the most fundamental, powerful human experience, which is love, to an acronym. How are we telling that story of longing how do we help others feel the injustice of forbidden, criminalised love? I mean, what we do is slander them as homophobes and transphobes and bigots and retrogrades. And of course, I'm not saying let's stop calling out bigotry because that's important. But bigotry itself is not the story. Our yearning for nurture and care and respect and dignity is the story. And that's something we all feel and understand. There's a couple of other ones, you know, climate justice. What does that mean to somebody who can't find work? Or digital rights, you know, if you're just trying to put food on the table. And a particular favourite, and I apologise for this BMW Foundation because I know it's an important one for you, social mobility. What is this social escalator that we talk about? Do we mean ending the indignity of poverty? Um, do we mean ensuring that everybody lives well and meaningfully, as is our right? Well, we should be saying that. One more. <laughs> a favourite. Sustainability. It's popular. It's attached to everything. It's compulsory. What hides, what, what hides behind this label? You know, do we really feel a sense of urgency to alter the course of human development so that we can continue living good lives on this planet? I'm not sure that we do. Our language is sort of dead, in a way, because it doesn't tell the story of our aspirations, of our, of our motives. It doesn't speak to the purity of our intentions. And you have to remember that nobody mocked us for wokery, for being woke, when our values were at the top of the tree culturally, you know, when they were hegemonic. Um, this culture war is an evidence of our decline, of our inability to speak to, to this story of our precious worldview that we share. And of course, the world is hitting that brick wall right now <laughs> under the weight of covid and just 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 like I did, um, just like I did back then in London a few years ago, the only option that we have right now is to leap forward, to leap into the new. And there is no safety net. We haven't done it before. You know, there's no set way of doing this. Our old world is sort of not there anymore, and the new one is not yet. And for this, we need a change model that is fit for the uncertainty, that is fit for the courage that um, that we need to summon. So how do we do that? How do we do change differently? The first thing that I need um, to tell you is that I grew up in communist Romania. And um, that's not, you know, it's not interesting in itself. But the thing that I need you to know is that I was eight years old, barely older than my daughter is now, when I saw a whole system, a whole way of being, disappear overnight as communism collapsed. And one split second, my nation changed from people proudly building socialism to millions refusing to be silenced by a totalitarian regime and ready to reinvent 
every single aspect of society, no stone left unturned. And, you know, the old story of us before the collapse of communism was also propped up by dead language that seemed unshakable. And that old reality was forever seemingly immovable. And what do you know? It was very movable indeed. And I know that our world right now um, feels like more than we have the power to change. But just as communism was propped up by the stories that we told ourselves about reality and about ourselves, so is this reality. Let me take you back to what happened after I moved my family back to Brussels in 2019. I set up flair, and I'll be quite honest with you, I mean, I shouldn't really say this, but I didn't even really know what it was when I set up. I knew it was a non-profit. Now I call it a think and do tank. But its sole purpose was to make it possible for people to come together and express hopes of something radically better than the present. Okay, To come together from all walks of life and talk about what society should deliver. You know, those things that we take for granted about the way in which our world is structured. And for a long while, I just had this instinct that I had to step outside of the change models that I knew. So I had to step outside of the policy spaces where lowest common denominator bargaining is the norm. And I also had to step outside of the campaigning spaces, you know, with all of their anger, because that's the tent that no one wants to visit. And I had this vision that was clear to me, but tricky to express clearly in words. So for a long time, that felt like failure, you know, because in our market driven mindsets, my product was unfinished and therefore undesirable. And for a long while, and I'm not even sure that long while is finished, to be honest, I'm not even sure it's over. I worried about paying the bills every month and felt this enormous pressure to make my work pay. I wasn't even sure if it qualified as work, if it failed by this kind of fundamental marker of adulthood, which was to be financially solvent. I wasn't. Um, and I persisted. I built this awesome team and all of us together put in months and months and months and months and months of work without pay. And we persisted and we had strategies and drew up beautiful plans for deliverables and we tried to adapt to donor agendas, you know, to make ourselves fundable and desirable. And then, of course, COVID struck and threw a massive spanner in the works. And we had to pause and reflect, which was uncomfortable. Um, it's uncomfortable because we are strivers, all of us. And also it was uncomfortable because we felt like we were at the beginning of our journey. So pausing, pausing felt um, counterintuitive. But it was transformative. <laughs> Um, it very slowly and very painfully, I won't lie to you, led us to the realisation that being marketable, fundable and solvent were important, but that was not our mission. It did not matter that no one, no one was paying us to do our work. It had to be done regardless, because it was important. Our mission was to keep trying to build a change model that works and to be congruent with our values. And that's what we did. You know, we lived the change that we believe in. We persisted. We did what we said we would. Um, we entered new spaces with humility and curiosity, you know, without trying to predetermine outcomes to fit our strategies. And we felt very vulnerable and very alive at the same time. And guess what? <laughs> it works. Um, because we got to discover from practice that modelling the things you believe, being authentic and brave, gives permission, it makes it possible for others to do the same and to want to do it with us. And that it's not our campaigning issues that bring people to our tent, but those shared beliefs and yearnings that we have and the space where they can be expressed. And that's how we made it possible for people to come together surprisingly and beautifully a few months ago and talk about the future of football, the thing they all loved. Not me, as it happens. I, I mean, I know nothing about it. Um, and to conclude that football can and should serve society and fans and not private greed. And you might think that by people, I mean, you know, a bunch of um, pious lefties. 
but about half of them were folk who make a living from the game. And yet these yearnings were shared and the moral story was shared. And as I was writing this talk, actually, um, UEFA ordered a football match to continue despite um, a player nearly dying on the pitch. So we know that there's still a long way to go between our aspirations and our, you know, um, our reality. But our aspirations must be uttered for them to eventually become reality. So to change systems, which we can and will have to do because of COVID, we first need to change ourselves. We have to see that what we say, that pale, lifeless, inadequate language, manifests itself into a deeply unpromising reality. There's only one way to change systems, by the way, um, and that is to alter what they are there to deliver, to voice that purpose with conviction, with clarity, with courage, and to stick to it, even if it seems impractical or risky. Okay, So our pre-COVID world uh, was set up to deliver private advantage, and there's nothing wrong with that. That was its primary objective. It was the, you know, the fundament of our neoliberal political economies. We can't be disheartened that it did it so effectively because that's what it was set up to do. And actually, that's also the story we told. It was a story of private striving and private rewards. And now I think our discontent comes from this unuttered yearning for shared dignity, you know, for, for nurture and care and meaningful lives and um, a planet that thrives, forgive the rhyme, um, which are all more inspiring than greed. So that's the story that we need to tell without fear, because that's our playing field, you know, and our own actions are our playing field. When they are congruent, authentic and brave, others will join us in our tent. And I think that's as true of global politics as it is of the school playground. So the starting point is this, OK? Just a few questions for you to think about. If society was the way it should be, what would it be set up to deliver? What needs to happen for that to be possible? And what do I and you do to make it happen? Thank you.